Hello, and welcome to The Mastering Show. This is the show where we talk about all aspects of mastering and plenty of stuff that's not about mastering as well. My name is Ian Shepherd. Uh, I'm a mastering engineer, and I run the production advice website aimed to help you get great results recording, mixing, and mastering your music. And this week, the topic is recording with high sample rates, particularly because there has just been a new piece of research that has come out uh, which casts uh, a new light on the topic, which I'll tell you about. And I've invited along to be my guest co-host this week, Russell Cotier, who is a producer, recording engineer, but also you do a bit of mastering as well, if as and when required. Is that right? Uh, that's, that's certainly correct, Ian, yes. Yeah. And we were just chatting before we started recording, and um, you were saying that, you know, that's not something that you actively promote necessarily, but presumably you get asked by clients to do, you know, you do some recording and some mixing for them, and then they're like, oh, can you master this as well? Is that how it tends to go? Uh, well, yes. I mean, the first studio that I worked in out of um, university, we would do uh, mastering, and that was in the days where people were bringing quarter-inch tapes, so sort of as late as uh, early 2000s. I had no idea you were that old. Uh, <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> um, early 2000s. So there were still people with analogue studios, yeah. sort of mostly private studios. So um, I started off doing mastering uh, in, in that aspect. But um, yeah, I, I do quite a lot of sort of studio to studio mastering jobs where other studios will send me things to do. Mm -hmm. um, other clients, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, and, and I suppose most of... Um, what I produce myself or mix myself, um, I tend to do the mastering uh, primarily for budgetary reasons because, um, you know, the clients are always wanting to save uh, some of their budget for promo or whatever they, they, they're looking and, at. And how do you find it, mastering your own stuff? You're presumably working on the same rig when you're doing that. You're listening to the same monitoring uh, and stuff. Sometimes I tend to leave it a few days. Mm -hmm. You're obviously going to end up with with issues i mean my mix room is far from perfect um so depending on where i'm mixing a project um if i'm in a, a larger studio then it's not such a such a problem but if they're both mixed in the same space um that that can be an issue and you just just something you've got to be aware of um and you know keep an eye on and like any engineer um in in any studio you get to know your space and, and your monitors and uh that's a really interesting point and I mean, you can tell me if you want me to cut this out, but, but I'm remembering that recently you did a recording at Abbey Road Studios, correct? Uh, I did, yes. Um, but yeah. you chose to mix it eventually in your own room. <laughs> well, uh, that's an interesting one. I actually mixed at uh, Abbey Road Studio 2, and that's that's quite an interesting control room because it's it's probably not really an ideal mix room. But yeah, I mean, it was the the content was mixed on the Neef in Control Room Two, and I wanted to do some tweaks. I came back, mixed in the box, um, which was is kind of unusual for me, actually. Um, yeah, because you've got a really nice console, haven't you? I, I've got a yeah. It's um, it's certainly got a backstory. It's the uh, it's a, it's a the Amec. Well, it's actually the TAC, uh, but it's been upgraded, um, and it was used for a load of sort of. Manchester bands, uh, Badly Drawn Boy and I Am Clute, Doves, all that kind of stuff. Cool. So, uh, so it's got a history. Uh, 1983, I think. So, um, so um, yeah. So the the, the story is, um, you know, Abbey Road. You, you, if you want something, you can have it. So, you know, I'm doing this mix on uh, Bracasti and um, Big Neve Desk, mm. and uh, as I say, I wanted to do some tweaks. So I came back and and um, so I rebuilt the mix in the box in Pro Tools, and sent the files off to the uh, to the client. And the client said, um, "Well, uh, I, I really like this uh, this one that says ITB on the end of it. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll go for that one." Uh, so D it was literally Dverb versus uh, Bracasti um, <laughs> and internal mix. Now, it, you know, it's it worked in that situation. Whether it would be. <laughs> be correct for everything i don't know but uh I, well I, see one of my big themes i mean you know this is is it ain't what you use it's the way that you use it 
And I think yeah. that's the perfect example um, because, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, the other issue with working somewhere like Abbey Road is just to do with the budget in the sense that, yes. you know, I don't know what a day there costs, but it's considerably more than a day mm. of your own time working in your own yeah. room. And especially if you're working for a client who has a budget that they've given you, um, mm -hmm. you know, I th we all have to make, you know, it's a kind of, it's a cost benefit thing, isn't it? You know, with Absolutely. an unlimited budget and all the rest of it, you might well choose to work somewhere like Abbey Road for an extended length of time until you get things mm. right. On the other hand, you might well choose not to. And both of those are valid choices but you know I, there's well, not many people who would have chosen to listen to one mix of another just because of the reverb it's ex exactly and that's that's the sort of key point isn't it um and and i suppose you know if you know your space you know what records sound like in that space you can push um i i'm not even sure what the differences were i think there was just some small rides and obviously the summing was done internally um but yeah, I mean, it's a matter of comfort, isn't it? And uh, whether you uh, whether you can bash out mixes uh, much faster in your own space. Um, sometimes it's nice to go to other places and feel inspired. But um, yeah, in terms of in terms of the mastering, sometimes what I'll do is um, you know I work at a few studios across the country, and um, sometimes I'll just you know double check my work in other in other places if I've done the mix in in the uh, the room that i'm mastering in so uh, uh wearing many hats uh, has its benefits in some ways and obviously drawbacks in others yeah well i think i mean i think the thing is realistically speaking anybody you spoke to these days would say something similar you know i, I think mm. from what i hear most uh especially kind of experienced mix engineers with a good track record are doing some degree of their own mastering, even if it's just kind yeah. of to give the clients an idea how it might sound when it's mastered, and then they send that as a reference to the engineer who who finally Absolutely, does the work. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, and and everything in between. And it's it's like I was talking to to Lidge about the you know the kind of the blurring of the boundaries mm. between a home studio and a real Definitely. studio. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but I think it's I good mean, for the, people who who are listening to shows like this to hear because I think. I find that information very empowering, you know? I mean, like, for example, I know that, um, you know, there's a ton of pro engineers who work predominantly in the box. Dave Pensado and Andrew Sheps and Dylan Dresdo. I think Mick Gazowski works in the box a lot of the time. A lot of the hip-hop guys and, you know, R&B producers are, are doing their own mixing. So, you know, there's all that. It, it's quite often not even a consideration to 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 go you know out of the box um yeah ex exactly i mean one thing i will say is is that that i don't generally approach so so a lot of um projects i get in are kind of home recorded things or uh, artists with their own small studios um i'd say probably 25% come from from that kind of background and I'll quite often get stems sent um, so I can do small corrections or liaise with them in, in um, you know, over a series of steps. Say, these, this is the mix tweak that I would advise before we go to the mastering stage. So that's another sort of kind of approach to mastering, I think, rather than just saying, give me the stereo track and we'll we'll move forward um and and having your own space does facilitate that as i think as liz was saying um you know the um the option of um using your time as you desire and you've not got someone else breathing down your neck wanting to come into the studio and reset the desk for for a different purpose or, or whatever so um yeah there's a lot of a lot of guys and girls out there who are doing sort of multifaceted workflows and incorporating their own workspace into uh, into their workflow whether it's just their own workspace or they're using big studios as well yeah absolutely no and, and like i say i think that's great for anybody here because you know it's well i mean that's uh, that's genuinely how i believe that it works you know it's it's the skills of the person doing the work rather than what Absolutely. they're using. And that kind of dovetails quite neatly into the topic I wanted to yeah. address this evening, which is um, this whole issue of, of high sample rates. So I'm sure everybody listening to this knows that, you know, uh, CD records at 44.1 kilohertz. You can also record at 48 kilohertz, which is used by DVDs and for broadcast, for example. And then we have the higher sample rates like 96 kilohertz and even 
192 kilohertz um, or SACD, which has some absurdly high sample rate. The big question is, do those higher sample rates really sound any better? Because all of the scientific evidence suggests or suggested that we can't hear any higher, certainly than 20 kilohertz. And in fact, most people, once they're past the age of, of 18, probably can't hear much beyond 16, maybe 18 kilohertz. Now, obviously, that's going to vary from individual to individual. So given that we can't hear those high frequencies, what's the point in having a high sample rate to reproduce them? Um, and of course, there's been lots of scientific research, or I don't know about lots, there has been a fair amount of scientific research, different studies that have investigated in this different ways. Some of them use test tones, some of them use real examples, some of them allowed comparison with the original sound source, some of them didn't. Um, and some of them, quite a few of them have shown that no, there is no benefit to having high sample rates, whatever people feel when they use them. And some of them actually have shown that yes, there is a benefit to high sample rates and or higher bit depths. Mm. So, and, and the interesting thing that has happened just in this last week or so is that has been an AES paper released, uh, a properly peer-reviewed uh, AES paper, which is, it's not a new piece of research on this topic. It's what they call uh, a meta-analysis. So Joshua Rice, who has put this together, has basically compiled all the evidence he can possibly get his hands on from all of these different uh, scientific investigations into this topic. So, you know, if he found one study and it mentioned another study in the references, he would go out and find the other study. And if that mentioned other studies in that, he would pull that together. And I think in the end, he had 12,000 separate trials of this subject, whether high sample rates um, are beneficial or at least audible. Mm for musical quality or not. Um, and then, they, the, this is a technique that comes from medical research. It's very common in medical research where you, you compi combine the results of all these different trials and then you examine all of them, you look for problems, you kind of reassess all of the data that was supplied and find a common core of data that you can rely on within a sort of fairly strict range. And they discount tests that obviously had problems or that may have had problems and then they apply statistical analysis techniques to kind of weight the data from one test to another to, mm. to kind of re-examine um, the results. And the advantage of this approach is that because you have combined all of these different studies together, you have a much larger number of overall trials that you can use, and therefore the results are much more robust and statistically significant. So they're much more reliable. And the reason I think this is an interesting thing to talk about is that the headline finding from his uh, meta research is that you can hear or it the study has shown that people do hear um, with a statistical significance small differences between higher sample rates and bit depths and cd quality which and he includes 48 kilohertz in cd quality which is interesting to me because the one thing that i personally have heard is 48 kilohertz sounding slightly different to 44.1. Yeah, absolutely. So 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 the fact that they're saying that basically either 44 or 40 or 48 versus 96 or higher um mm. there is still an audible difference is the fascinating thing about the study. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about it is that since this report has been published I've seen lots and lots of blog posts and kind of comments on forums and all the rest of it of people kind of going well, duh, we knew that. Everybody knows that higher sample rates sound better, and this just proves it. And and that's the bit where I kind of insert the record scratch and say, well, hang on, we need to think about it a bit yeah. differently. It's important to remember a few things, though, here, isn't it? That it, that it is a meta-analysis and it is a statistical... Um, the, the, the data um, do not necessarily adhere to the same uh, testing rules. So, um, if you if you go through the, uh, the 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 paper in full, there's uh, uh, a metric ton of, uh, <laughs> of statistical analysis, and as you said, discounting certain tests. So, I, th I think it's very easy for sort of non-science 
folks to say, oh, this is, this paper proves this or disproves this or whatever. Um, whereas, as you mentioned before, we're really looking for um, whether something is um, st statistically significant, and then that generally pushes more research to to take place, doesn't it? I mean, it's not as if this is a sort of the end uh, result, um, you know, the 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 absolute definitive answer as to whether higher sample rates are um, are effective or not. You well, know, this we is the yeah. To. I mean, it doesn't actually say anything about whether they're better or not. What it says is yes. th that the where people reported differences because lots of the studies they didn't there's a very famous study where they had you know high sample rate recordings they played them to people and then they played them the same thing just with a, a high cut filter at 20 kilohertz similar to the type yeah. that's used in on a you know when you're recording for cd or down sampling for cd and people just didn't notice the difference they didn't notice those high frequencies yeah. disappear and that's often been held up as kind of categorical proof so even when you combine negative studies like that with the positive studies and all the rest of it, and you weight all of this data, they do find that people are hearing a difference. And I think we should probably just mention this, the percentages, right? So it was, yeah. so if there was no audible difference between higher sample rates and forty-four point one or forty-eight k, you would expect over that number of over twelve thousand trials, or I think actually they only ended up with 400 trials being part of the final data set yes, that they decided yeah. could be comparable because of all of those variations mm. between the tests that you mentioned. But even so, it's a very large sample in comparison to most tests where it's like 20 or 30 tests. Mm. You would expect it to be 50-50 if there was no difference, and actually the split was 53-47%. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. One thing that was very interesting in the study that I don't have any issue with uh, at all was that they also analysed the difference between people who were uh, kind of just regular music listeners, people, you know, who, I don't know about came in off the street, but certainly, you know, weren't uh, trained in any way to listen to audio or aware in advance of what the differences might be. They compared the differences that those people could hear versus people who were trained in the sense that they were played examples and said, okay, listen, here's one thing, here's another, you can hear the difference. Um, and they were given kind of time to acclimatize themselves and then take the test. And in that case, where people had had a chance to learn what they were listening to, uh, the percentage shifted, and you had a sixty forty result. Yeah, and I I think that's actually the more interesting uh, phenomenon uh, that's that's been um, investigated, really, because if if people are educated as to, to how to hear uh, specific um, artifacts, then their appreciation and enjoyment of of music will change and i wonder whether that's the case for audio pros because you know if you're a mix engineer or a mastering engineer or uh, you know a recording engineer then you, you you definitely hear music differently recorded music differently and and likewise musicians will hear music differently to your average punter who's a non-musician um, I, I definitely you know. think it's a factor because i mean i vividly remember the first time i ever compared a different mp3 compression codex um, yeah. way back in the dim and distant past, we had a client who wanted us to provide them with MP3 files as well as CD masters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, that's something these days, I just I just won't go there. I'm kind of like, you know, yeah. if you want to MP3 your stuff, you know, <laughs> that's your lookout. But um, I, I mean, I have to say most encoders now are far better than they were then. But we auditioned four or five different encoders. Um, and I remember you know, listening back to them on the main monitoring. And I was working with Nick Watson back then, and we were working on this together. And I was kind of like, well, that one I think sounds pretty good. And he looked at me, he was appalled. He was like, you're kidding. He said, you know, how how could, that's hideous. And I was like, no, it's not. It's, and, and I was I was listening <laughs> to it again, and I couldn't understand why he objected it too much. Sure. And he, he kind of, he looked at me, he said, but, but can't you hear the swirling ultrasonic birdies? <laughs> and I kind of looked at him as though he was insane and then I played it back and listened and suddenly I heard you know the kind of familiar that thing where you've actually you tend to get it where an encoder is rolling out less of the very high end so there's more high frequency content which is harder for the mp3 encode, codec yeah. to encode efficiently and you yeah you know that kind of almost like somebody is gently playing the chime bars in the back in the, in, in the distance yeah. you know and, and suddenly I could hear what he meant I was like oh <gasps> You're right. you're right and from then on that you know 
I heard that on everything. And it was that process of somebody pointing out to me what, you know, I was listening to kind of the overall sound and the, the punch mm. in the bass. And, and I just liked the fact that this particular encode had a bit more top end in it uh, in comparison well, to know, the others. But it was only when I looked at it through that kind of, well, there weren't any swirling ultrasonic birdies on the original and there are on this. And, <laughs> and I don't like them at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I like that description, ultrasonic birdies. It's good. I, yeah. I'm, you know, I, I was doing um, uh, a record some years ago um, and uh, there was a... Obviously, some kind of fault in. I'm not really sure. I think it was from a um, an old Paluso, um, you know, the 47 copy. Um, not that old, um, mm-hmm. but it it had been dropped, and um, it was a punk record. Look after of, your mics, ladies and gentlemen. Well, well, yeah, absolutely. Not dropped by myself. I was in someone yeah. else's studio, um, and it was not dropped by the studio, and it was dropped by a visiting engineer. Unfortunately, they hadn't informed the the studio, and a problem had had occurred in the microphone where there was a sort of ultra high pitched uh, tone uh, around sort of uh, probably like seventeen, fifteen, seventeen k. Now. Obviously, when you smash that through uh, an 1176 with a with an aggressive punk vocal and print out a mix, it, it probably an age related thing. the The frequency was slightly beyond my my range, which is kind of normal as you you know you you pass into your thirties. And um, uh, the band were all a bit younger, uh, and they sent comments back saying, "Well, what's what's the uh, what's the sound? The the buzzing." And I was saying, what buzzing? Do you mean distortion? Uh, and, and they didn't have the the uh, the knowledge to say, oh, it's a frequency. It's this particular frequency. So I'm listening for something completely different. You know, it, it literally took um, it took me um, putting my head up against. I put it on in the car and um, put my head right up against the speaker and full volume. You know, in between the uh, in between the vocal tracks to to try and hear this frequency. And I said, "Oh, if you told me it was a high pitched uh, tone, then uh, then we could have saved ourselves uh, a lot of uh, uh, toil." You know, my yeah. my, uh, my other half who listens to a lot of my mixes and uh, pulls faces mostly uh, <laughs> as they do, uh, you, you know, could not believe that I couldn't hear this. Um, but I guess it's very much like the old. Uh, the old uh, golden uh, golden white versus blue and black dress uh, phenomenon, isn't it? For, if you're sort of a non-audio person, you could probably uh, uh, parallel it with those kind of optical illusions where as soon as you are aware that the, there is something there, you see it or you hear it straight away. But until you've been trained to... Um, to understand it, then then it's quite often difficult to identify that those things are present. Yeah, you know? no, I, I agree. And I mean, I think before anybody kind of thinks training, I'm not. We're not talking about you know teaching somebody to be an audio engineer. Even it's just it's more kind of case yeah. of having the thing pointed out to you. You know, yeah. so that, like I mean, the, the the blue and gold dress thing is quite a good example mm. because you know until I read about the controversy, if I had seen that dress, I mean, I was somebody who always saw the dress as gold. <laughs> well, that's really interesting because um, <laughs> you saw it as blue. It's, it's blue and black to me. <laughs> well, I think um, actually, it, uh, it kind of rigorously, it is blue and black. It's just in that photograph you can see it in the two yeah, ways because of, of the weird, yeah, yeah. this weird kind of thing that happens in our brains. That is, you know. Um, so yeah, it's a fascinating thing. I and mean, maybe that's not the perfect example. Uh, there are some. Other I think it kind of is because because you can almost almost hear that two ways. Um, you know, it's the same as the the picture. That look, is it a vase or is it two faces yeah. facing each other, or does the cube come out of the page towards you, or does it go mm-hmm. in? You know, all of those. I think that's absolutely right. You can, in the sense that you see or hear something, just a certain way, and then suddenly some tiny little thing can flip it, and suddenly you hear something completely different. And and that kind of brings us to the Simpsons paradox um, that was was detailed in the paper as well, which is the presence of a, an unknown variable um, skewing the results, really, isn't it? Um, so you know that they mention several times in the in the in the meta analysis uh, that there may be other factors going on. Yeah, well, um, let, let's pause for a second and just so kind of re- retrace because we went on a slight tangent there talking yeah. about how you know kind of trained <laughs> listeners can listen. But coming back to the fundamental finding, the paper did decide. You know, using a scientific analysis that I respect, that 
overall, over all of these years, and some of these trials go way back, yeah. um, and even if you kind of f- factor in for some of the the kind of the differences that might exist between the tests, like even if you exclude the old tests on the basis that maybe older digital gear wasn't as good as modern digital gear, people can still hear these differences. So there definitely is an audible difference between these high sample rate recordings and the low sample rate recordings. So you might be tempted to think from that, well, there you go. You know, if you can hear a difference, then obviously 90 or 96 and higher sample rates are better. But I mean, the paper itself lists a number of reasons that could be contributing to the differences that people are hearing that have nothing to do with it actually being higher quality. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's what you're talking about, you know. In well, this, yeah, because, and, and, you know, the, the the one of the key things I thought was that none of these were conducted with headphones. Um, so, you know, you're very much at the mercy of the acoustics of the the rooms, which weren't mentioned at all in the in the meta analysis, um, as far as I can remember, and they might have been, but um, I uh, I don't recall any no, mentions of room were. acoustics. Um, well, there's room and acoustics, monitors, and there's monitors, you know, there's, um, there's so many things. Yeah, well, there's there's monitors. I mean, there's just the, the converters that we use. I mean, well, even the digital formats. You know, I mean, because yeah. in terms of di- some of them used uh, SACD, the Super Audio CD format that um dsd that i've mentioned which is not as some people think actually fundamentally different from normal pcm it's just that it uses one bit and incredibly high sample rates but i mean effectively you it's functionally equivalent to i think uh, 196 24 yeah um that kind of that kind of ballpark but it includes lots of high frequency noise that actually can mask a lot of the high frequency content that might have been there originally. Um, mm. Then there's 2496 recordings, 192. One of the tests was comparing 24 bit with 16 bit recordings, uh, and they didn't use dither. And oddly enough, that was one of the trials that apparently showed quite a strong uh, ability for people to detect the difference. Um, and just for anybody who's keeping score, I've now had 12 requests for an episode of the podcast on Dither, so <laughs> I probably will be doing that at some future point, so I'm not going to go into that particular rabbit hole right now. And one of my favourite issues that was mentioned but not really kind of addressed in the paper was this thing uh, called intermodulation distortion. So I don't think I can adequately explain, I'm not even sure I adequately understand how intermodulation <laughs> distortion works, but the short version is... Uh, in a perfect audio system, uh, you get in what you put out, apart from possibly scaling it with a volume control. Um, there are no systems that are that perfect, even a digital system. I mean, a digital system can approach that kind of level of perfection, but certainly an analog system. And, you know, don't forget, any an- any digital system we have has an analog stage, at least at the output and at the input. So there are always analog electronics involved and they are never perfect. Some of them get very close to being perfect and some of them are substantially better than others. But in general, all analog systems will introduce some kind of distortion into the signal, be it noise, you know, kind of harmonic distortion, whatever it might be. And, you know, back in the days when analog consoles were king, SSL and everybody else was, Neve, struggling to minimise those effects. When you get that kind of change to the signal, and I kind of mentioned this again in in the episode I did on distortion, you are technically distorting the signal, and the signal is what's called non-linear. So in a linear system, you get it out a perfectly scaled version of what you put in. In a non-linear system, you get almost a perfect version of what you put in, but (laughs) not quite. And depending on how non-linear the system is, it could be substantially different or it could be very, very similar. So... Every system is nonlinear to some degree, and what you tend to find is that most systems are much more nonlinear at very low and very high frequencies, um, because understandably the the people who build the gear optimize it for, you know, the, the audible frequency range, the bit that's most important for our ears, which most of the evidence seems to suggest is twenty hertz up to twenty kilohertz. Absolutely. So yeah. then the question is, how nonlinear does stuff get? outside of those frequency ranges and what is the effect of it what you find is that some of this nonlinear distortion that can creep into the signal if there is significant 
ultrasonic content in the signal, meaning above 20 kilohertz, the distortion from those signals that are the system you're playing it back on or that you recorded it with can't cope with can be spread across the whole audible spectrum. So just because, let's say you've got, um, you know, something happening up at 30 kilohertz in the audio signal, which, you know, you get that that happens with things like muted trumpets or plenty of percussion instruments. You know, it's not an uncommon thing. Mm. Um, even if your system is not capable of reproducing those frequencies, or particularly if your system isn't capable of reproducing those frequencies, you might still hear something as a result of those frequencies because of these nonlinear distortions, these intermodulation distortions yeah, that crop yeah. up in the system. And I mentioned this briefly in the analog versus digital episode, but anybody who's interested in this can, and I think actually everybody who's listening to this should test their own system for these problems. Um, and I will include in the show notes a link to a blog post that I did, which has a link in it to, you can download some test files. There are three different test files, each of which has kind of different types of ultrasonic content in them. If you play those test files back on your system, if it's working correctly, you won't hear anything because they are categorically beyond the frequency where we can hear them. There's no signal below 20 kilohertz where we can hear it. So if your system is functioning correctly, you should not hear these signals. What most people will find is that actually they can hear something because most systems are somewhat flawed. Um, so, you know, on the stock output of my Mac Pro, I can hear something. On one of the uh, D2A converters I have here, I can hear something. On one of the other ones, I can't. If I put in a high quality sample rate converter to reduce things down to so that everything is below 20 kilohertz, I can't hear it. That's the correct result. So there's a simple test. And a lot of that, I guess, is about um, the analog stages and, and filtering uh, within within your converters. Yeah, well, we, let's get on to filtering in a sec. Um, but absolutely, it's and, and the thing is, it could happen at any stage. So, for example, it might happen on the headphone output of your gear, but not on the main output to the monitor speakers, or vice versa. Or it might be fine on your converter and in your amplifier, but happen in the speakers. Or it might not happen in the speakers, but it might happen in the amplifier. Every separate component in your listening chain after the digital to analog converter might be susceptible to this problem. And just to kind of, before we move on, the point about this is if your system makes audible sounds when you play it that ultrasonic content, it's possible that when you play high sample rate material that has uh, content that goes up into those ultrasonic frequencies, that that is the reason you're hearing a difference. Not because your yeah. system is playing it about better, it's just sounding different because actually it's got a little bit of extra distortion in there. And I think the other thing to say is that you might prefer it because well, most yeah. of us expect high sample rate content to have more life and more air in the, the signal. Um, if you have a tiny little bit of high frequency distortion in there, that's exactly the kind of effect that you hear. So it is possible that lots of people who have tried comparing 96 with 44.1 or whatever are actually hearing this distortion instead of a genuine, more musical, you know, better recorded signal. Sure, yeah. Um, I, th I think, you know, that with with the sort of plugging of, of the commercial aspect of, of uh, high sample rate audio, uh, I know Sony are, are doing a push uh, for, for it, I think they're branding it high definition audio or something like that. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're sort of suggesting that you can hear more detail. Um, and as you kind of mentioned, that might not necessarily be the case in an obvious way. One of the examples that Sony gave on one of their recent uh, videos to, to plug this new technology, uh, well, new technology, old technology, really, um, was that you would be able to hear a finger brush across a piano key um, more uh, realistically, um, details that would be lost in in lower quality audio. And I, I think that's true, but only to an extent, isn't it? Um, it's not so much about you won't hear this particular nuance. It's that the, the higher frequencies are audible and they will make these things sound um, specifically different um, and I guess you know the, the whole aliasing is, is something that might be worth discussing as well 
Yeah, we could touch on that. So before I forget, I think one thing I want to say that I think there's a misconception. Lots of people expect higher sample rates and uh, correctly dithered audio versus truncated <laughs> audio, for example, to sound toppier, to sound clearer, yeah. to sound... My experience is always the exact opposite. When I have compared, well, say, for example, 48 versus 44.1, where I can hear a difference, a small difference, and there are possible reasons why yeah. I could hear that difference, but that's the test that I've done that I know I can hear. Or when I compare dithered versus truncated 16-bit audio, I think pretty much without exception, the, the higher quality one sounds smoother to me. It actually sounds slightly softer. Um, yes. Sounds yeah, less I, absolutely. Topic. And absolutely. I think that's a key thing to bear in mind because, uh, you know, the, I think in both cases, the, the lower quality signal has been slightly degraded, slightly distorted. And quite often we perceive that as actually sounding a little bit edgier, a little bit brighter, a little bit harsher, a little bit grittier. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a risk of people kind of flip their perception of it and and actually you quite often i've I've read on multiple occasions people kind of saying oh well i compared the dithered and the undithered versions and i preferred the one without dither and i'm concerned that the reason they picked that is it just sounded that little bit kind of yeah grittier and edgier Hi and that they therefore chose the one that hyped. technically was yeah hyped exactly yeah that, that was worse um so yeah i just wanted to kind of get that in there yeah the i mean I, I went through a phase in um, probably ooh, 20, 2008, 2009 of making sure everything was 2496. Um, now, obviously, uh, in, in the context of recording, then, you know, I think there was a difference. Uh, but, but in the context of recording, there's, there's practicality measures to, um, <laughs> to ensure, isn't there, uh, in terms of you know, processing power and, and data storage. So um, sound quality is not necessarily the only thing that you have to consider. It's whether you're actually going to be able to complete a project. Now, in the mastering side of things, um, that's probably less of an issue. But it's definitely worth sort of thinking about as to, you know, uh, there are going to be restrictions. And whilst certain things might sound smoother, which I think they do, um, certainly 2496, um I listen back to those recordings and they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, at CD quality. Um, and I think there's a difference even even at that point as well, you know. That practicality measure is something that needs to be considered as well um, yeah. in, in terms of... I think we can revisit that point kind of at the end yeah. when we try and sum all of this up because I, I, I definitely agree with you that's a factor. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, even if this study even if there's kind of the research that follows on from this this AES paper that we're talking about, eventually shows that there really are genuinely audible benefits to the higher sample rates. And we can't rule that out. I don't have a theoretical reason to think that might be true at the moment, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Even if, you know, they, they find something real, you know, you've got to bear in mind that small percentage. You know, over the whole number of listeners, it was uh, kind of 53% in terms of could hear a difference versus 47% who couldn't. Um, you know, that's a small number of people hearing a small difference rather than, you know, if it was a 90%, 10% split, you'd have something that was clearly better for everybody and we should all be doing it. And I'm pretty confident that that's what you get if you tested kind of, you know, a 22 kilohertz sample rate versus 44.1 yeah. kilohertz sample rate, for example. But yes, when you consider the relatively small number of people who are going to be sensitive to this difference and appreciate it you might want to consider the practicalities of you know like you say uh bang for your buck um absolutely but you mentioned aliasing aliasing yes, is yeah. uh obviously a it's a problem that can occur with a digital system if it doesn't have the right filtering in and now we get to the filtering because we've been talking about quite esoteric points like intermodulation distortion and different types of high sample rate format and dither versus truncation distortion but the kind of the elephant in the room is that the other thing that wasn't common to any of these tests was the converter technology that was used so some of them used the Pacific Microsonics HDCD. Some of them uh, used uh, prism converters. I think that, you know, the whole range of technology yeah. used to convert the digital signals in, back into analog and indeed to encode them into digital in the first place. 
Um, and and the kind of the key difference between those different converters is going to be the filtering system that was used. Because when you record digital, you know, digital only works if you remove uh, all the frequencies that are above half the sample rate. If you're sampling at 44 kilohertz, you have to filter out all the content above 22 kilohertz. Otherwise, you will get aliasing distortion, which you mentioned. And if you the want Nyquist. to preserve, the, right, that's technically called yeah. the Nyquist uh, yeah. frequency. If, if which they is, want to look it up. Yeah, <laughs> nobody wants to look it up. We can include some links in the, the show notes. Um, and this comes from the sampling theorem, which, you know, it's a brief tangent. Lots of people kind of claim that the fact that a high sample rate audio sounds different to lower sample rate audio means that Nyquist must f in some way be wrong. You know, if Nyquist was wrong, digital audio itself wouldn't work, full stop. It's, you know, all this stuff we're talking about is based on that theorem, the sampling theorem yeah. that all this stuff comes from. So anyway, the point is you have to have these filters and you have to have a filter on the output of a, a digital to analog system as well on the converters when you play it back. And there are various ways of designing those filters. So you can have oversampling systems that have been in use since the pretty early days of digital, where you actually, the, the clock in the chip runs at a higher sample rate, which means you can use gentler filters, so they have less effects. You know, I mean, the point about filters is there is always going to be a compromise. Um, you either and have And they to sound have, so different as well, don't they? Exactly. Um, different you know. filters sound completely different depending on how they're engineered. Some people will go for a very sharp cutoff frequency, which will tend to cause more influence on the phase of the audio near the cutoff frequency. Some people will use more gentle filters where the phase change effects near the crossover are less. But obviously, because it's more gentle, it extends further down in the frequency range. So if you if everything is going to cut off by say twenty kilohertz, you know the, you might start to hear the the effects of that filter as far down as sixteen kilohertz. So yeah. if you compare that with a filter with a sharp cutoff frequency, uh, chances are it would sound a little bit softer in the high frequencies than the filter that had the very sharp cutoff. But the one with the very sharp cutoff might have more phase effects, and those may or may not be audible. So you know, you can argue about which is better and how audible any of these effects are. But the simple fact is, with all of those tests that were there, we have no real idea what filtering systems were used, whether they were implemented well or not. You know, I mean, it's it's possible that there were design flaws in some of those filters. You know, just to take a simple example, if you... This is why different CD players sound different. This is why hi-fi magazines can still <laughs> make money <laughs> reviewing CD because you know the the digital the, the the digits on every disc are the same. In theory, it's possible to reproduce identical sounding audio from any CD of the, that's got the same recording on it um, or any any digital file. In practice, um, exactly how the 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 analog circuitry in the piece of gear works will cause differences. And of course, one of the most blatant ones is level differences. That's another thing that wasn't yeah. uh, kind of accounted for in this, uh, in the meta study. I mean, they, they mention it as a factor. And, and, and I think, you know, the point is all of those factors they mentioned are reasons for future research, because you would hope that the people who did those tests very carefully level matched all of their comparison examples so that that wasn't going to be a factor in what people heard. But we don't know for certain whether or not that was done in any case. Absolutely. I mean, the, the information off, uh, ab about durations of playback and rest periods between playback and the equipment and so on, they weren't complete for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the studies. Um, as far as um, Joshua could only find out a certain amount of information. So, so and they were all some... using different tests. You know, some of them had different, yeah, absolutely. So some of them different. had tests. Were using test tones. Some of them they all, they all had different objectives, and all of that is discussed very thoroughly in the paper. But I think you know, yeah, it's, you know, if we start to wrap this up, what we're saying is the paper does show that there are audible differences in systems that record at different sample rates. Yeah, but it doesn't say anything about where those differences come from. And it might be that those differences come from genuine musical benefits of recording those higher frequencies that we think we're pretty confident nobody can hear. 
as kind of paradoxical as that seems, you know, you can't rule that possibility out. But before you reach that conclusion, there are a ton of different things that need to be investigated, like probably most fundamentally just the, the different converters we used and the different filters and the way they were implemented and whether or not any of those systems were susceptible to intermodulation distortion and whether different types of material uh, are more revealing of any differences or not, whether they were there and whether or not there were proper systems of loudness matching used in the trials and whether the amplification and reproduction systems and the acoustics that you mentioned, you know, that's that's an awful lot more there's, scientific there's so research things, that needs they? to be done. That, that's right. <laughs> the average um, sort of engineer can almost do their own tests. Um, obviously, you can be thrown somewhat and convince yourself of one thing or another. But if if you um, if you're careful, um, it, it's quite possible to to like you said about the uh, MP3 encoders. Uh, it's quite possible to. Uh, implement your own a b comparisons in the studio and um you know if, if you can find uh, someone else to do that with you so you can do it blind then you know there are there are various options there i mean i, I would say the only issue there is is the reset time because it's very easy to forget what something sounds like isn't it well that's interesting though we should probably mention that quickly because one of the things that came out of this meta study was that there was also, as well as finding that people who had had the chance to learn what these audio signals sounded like um, were better at detecting the differences, um, it also found that, or it seemed to show, that people who listened to longer samples, uh, 20 or 30 seconds long, and then had a rest in between them, actually were slightly better at detecting the differences than people who did shorter instant A-B tests, which... I found fascinating. It's something I've heard mentioned yeah. before, and it actually flies. I mean, it's the the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, mm. um, the you know that the AES and everybody else liaise with. Their recommendation is actually for no longer than ten or fifteen samples, second yes. samples, yes, um, when you're doing these kind of tests because they're concerned about listener fatigue. So, I I found that a fascinating. Um, well, there are certain differences that I know from my own experience are best heard with an AB. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, perception, the plugin that I designed is is kind of all about AB testing with loudness compensation. And yeah. for me, you know, when I use it, I find there are all kinds of differences that suddenly leap out at me when things have been loudness matched and when I can seamlessly and instantly switch from one to the other. Having said that, there have been other occasions where I've been, you know, AB testing things and you kind of go ear blind where you just completely yeah. lose your perspective and you just kind of sit there and let it run for a bit and then flick back to the other one and suddenly go oh and feel like so So i guess that's an instinct that i've had you know sometimes that listening to longer samples can be more revealing and it was quite fascinating to to find that actually there's some experimental evidence for that yes yeah absolutely <laughs> um <laughs> I, I think it's a it's a it's a tricky one, isn't it, to, uh, to to quantify? And again, that's a whole other area of study, isn't it, as to how the the psychoacoustics of this whole thing uh, function. And and you know, it depends what you're looking for. Um, so I guess the ITU are have a very specific intent in in what they want to to look at. So you're absolutely right. People can do their own tests if. Anybody listening to this, if you want to do your own test to try and decide whether you can hear the difference between high sample rate recordings and kind of normal 44.1 or 48 kilohertz sample rate recordings, I just want to give you a few guidelines. Um, the first thing you need to do is to go to the, uh, the blog post that I'm going to put in the show notes where you can get those sample files and check your system for intermodulation distortion. Because if your system can't play back those ultrasonic samples cleanly meaning you play it back at your normal listening level and you don't hear a thing and incidentally you need to kind of start and stop the files because quite often our ears become immune to steady state noise so you're sitting there listening to this thing play and you think no i can't hear anything and then you you know press stop and suddenly you can you can just that tiny little difference if your system is vulnerable to those kind of issues it's not necessarily a problem, but you can't make any hard and fast conclusions about the quality of high sample rates because it's probably caused by intermodulation distortion. So stage one, rule that out. Then 
if you're going to do any comparisons, you need to make sure that they are perfectly loudness matched, which shouldn't be an issue. The final thing is to only do your tests at the high sample rate. So let's say you're comparing 96 kilohertz with 44.1 you need to take your 96 kilohertz file, which needs to have some frequency content above 20 kilohertz. You know, you need to run an analyzer and just check that there's something going on up there. Otherwise you're not testing what you think you are um, necessarily, although that's a whole other area of research. We won't go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got your sample. It's got some ultrasonic content in it. Use a really high quality sample rate converter to convert it down to 44 kilohertz then you need to upsample it back to 96 kilohertz or whatever your higher sample rate is because some converters will sound different at different sample rates simply because of the way they're designed. So that's another factor. You could conceivably be hearing differences simply because of the way your converter works. For example, it might use a different type of filter or a different filtering circuit at one sample rate versus another and that can introduce a difference that doesn't actually have anything to do with the signal you're playing back. It's just a design aspect. So you can rule that out by doing all your tests at 96 kilohertz. Um, upsampling from 44.1 to 96 will have no audible benefit, um, but it won't or it shouldn't degrade the signal either if you're using a high quality converter. So when you do your comparison, your replay system stays at 96 kilohertz the whole time, but you're comparing the 96 kilohertz with the upsampled 44.1. If you've got all of those things in place, level matched, no intermodulation distortion, same sample rate for playback, even though you're comparing the different sample rates, then you have a fair test. And then if you can hear a difference, maybe you're hearing the benefits of high sample frequencies. And I would like to say, if anybody listening to this does those tests, if you do these tests and genuinely feel you're hearing a difference, I would love it if you would drop me an email and... Maybe we can all go and pay a visit uh, to <laughs> hear the... Um, to visit the studio of the people who can hear the Well, difference. I want to um... hear it on my own system first. <laughs> and then if I can hear a difference and I agree with you, that's when it starts getting really interesting. Um, I'm not sure that we'll get enough numbers for this uh, to be genuine. <laughs> but I mean, that kind of gives you an example of how careful you have to be when you're doing these kind of tests, you know? Even a simple test... What seems like a simple test for us, you have to be so careful. And then when you go into the whole kind of making sure that the listening is blind and double blind and all of those other factors, it's it's so easy to see why there are still so many variables in, in, in the scientific yeah. research, why we can't just jump to the conclusion that so many people are jumping to when they read this paper that, oh, there you go, I told you, um, you know, I always knew I could hear the difference. As you say, it may be that your converters just sound better at uh, whatever circuit they're using um, at 96 or whatever. In in a practical example of that, um, you know, I was using radar systems for recording um, several records uh, and they were limited to 44.1 for some reason. Um, and... You know, they, those converters sound absolutely wipe the floor with certain other converters. Yeah, other high end converters, but um, ones maybe working at, at 48, um, so or 96 even. It's so very much uh, is down to the analog side of things, um, whether they're designed to uh, work effectively with the digital side in, in that specific instance. And of course, I suppose we all have to remember that. You know, most of our records are going to be listened to on our earbuds uh, and, and mobile phones. So maybe that's something to bear in mind um, as to how they're going to deal with with um, higher higher sampling rates, um, yeah, I mean, particularly be, in the future. It might be a good point to finish on is people might think listening to this that I'm kind of saying, oh, no, high sample rates are pointless. Um, that's not the case. All I'm saying is that even with this new study, the issue is not settled. You know, it's an open question. Yeah. And if people want to know my advice, <laughs> of course, the answer is it depends. There's some easy answers. If your system is vulnerable to intermodulation distortion, I recommend you avoid high sample rates. Um, because if it's showing those kind of problems on playback, it may well be vulnerable to them on the record side as well. And in that case, I just genuinely don't see a benefit of doubling the bandwidth of your 
you know, doubling the size of your recorded yeah. audio files for something that is not genuinely better. If your system's not vulnerable to intermodulation distortion and you would like to record at 96 kilohertz, why not? Uh, I mean, Don Lavery, who's the guy behind, you know, the Lavery, Lavery converters, some, yeah. of, some of the best converters out there, has written about this. And in his opinion, I think it's 60 kilohertz would be an ideal sampling rate. I think he feels that, the, you know, particularly in terms of including factors like kind of making things cost effective, bang for your buck, um, efficiency, all the rest of it. If the system reproduces everything up to 30 kilohertz, right, half the sample rate um, accurately, that's sufficient that nobody will ever hear a significant difference. Yeah. Um, but you don't, uh, you, you save yourself a whole load of engineering headaches, um, you know, and uh, that's that's the sweet spot. And unfortunately, we don't have that as an option for sample rates. I mean, you know, 48 kilohertz is close, 50 versus 60. You yeah. know, you might argue there's not a huge difference. Um, 96 is probably overkill. 192 is definitely overkill. I, <laughs> I genuinely don't see any benefit to that. But if people want to be future-proof and the system isn't vulnerable to intermodulation distortion, then, you know, why not? Well, that was the other point I was going to mention. You know, with, with data being so... Sto data storage being so cheap at the moment, um, and it will get cheaper and cheaper, obviously, according to Moore's law, the reasons for um, storing that kind of data are, are reducing. Um, but I guess when you think of it on a global scale, um, you know, the... The whole thing scales up dramatically. Um, and yeah, but if you're if it's, if if you're talking about a you know twenty four track mix, maybe the difference is not exactly. that huge. But if it's if it's thirty two, if it's sixty four tracks, or you know hundred oh, yeah, I mean you know, that's it. Can can you run? Uh, you know, unless you've got a, a DSP systems, um, and there's a lot of people working native these days, then even with a DSP system, running 128 tracks of heavily processed mix um, at you know 2496 is, is a serious undertaking and and you'll quite often run out of voices or you know your your um your cpu will start to struggle especially as people are working in a way where they they want to kind of merge the mixing and um and recording stage so you know with dropping plugins in during the tracking you're starting to really sort of push the system um, mm, absolutely well, and especially I mean, even with some DSP systems, like people who use the universal audio stuff, yeah. you know, I think there are situations where those can start to run out of processing power. Um, and at that point, I think you would have to kind of think to yourself, is the trade-off worthwhile? You know, it's, it's again, yeah. it's kind of cost versus benefits. I'm going to get to the mastering maxim in a second, which people will probably not be very surprised by, but let's just put our cards on the table. Uh, Russell, do you record at high sample rates? I tend to go um, 48K, 24-bit. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll occasionally push it to 96 if it's something that I think might be called upon for broadcast or DVD. Uh, but for most of the rock stuff that I do, um, 2496. Uh, sorry, 2448 um, is, is where I'm at usually. Yeah, that's cool. And... Um now I feel mean because actually I can't put my cards on the table because the the honest answer is I'm actually not doing uh, any tracking these days. <laughs> um, if if I do, I go to a studio and there I will go with whatever the engineer prefers because it's genuinely not worth getting into an argument yeah. with somebody who feels passionately about this stuff. <laughs> and if if I had to make a judgment call, I honestly I would have to do the tests that I'm talking about here. You know, uh, so five or six years ago I did some tests. And that was when I discovered that I could hear a difference between a 48K and a 44.1K recording. That might well have been down to filter design and or limitations in the playback technology. I don't know, but I do know that I heard a difference. It was small. You know, it was one of those kind of less than 1% differences, um, but I could hear it blind. Um, I couldn't hear the difference with the material that I was using on the system that I was using, which was very good, between 96 and 48. Um, so at that point, you know, that kind of underlies my opinion until now, but it's been so long 
and I, 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 think I now know 14... so much more about the topic. I think I would want to, I would want to redo those yeah. tests myself. I think, I think you're very right in the 44.1 and 48 are um, noticeably different. Um, on Even most then, though, systems. I mean, do you? I mean, I guess the thing is, I guess 48 makes you. I don't know. I don't want to say future proof. Uh, but, but I mean, at least you can supply, you know, broadcasters at 48, DVD uh, is, c- can yeah. support 48 kilohertz. So in that sense, because, I mean, one argument would be, well, what's the point of even recording at 48? Because the vast majority of stuff, you know, all the down all CDs, downloaded files, almost all of them run at 44 kilohertz. Yeah. You know, is um, and, and, and then you're introducing an extra layer of sample rate conversion, I, which I think- if you do it well, can sound perfect or damn near perfect. But... If the converter you're using is not uh, optimal, even that can introduce a little bit of degradation. So, I mean, it, there's swings and roundabouts, whichever way you look at it. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot of even independent artists who are uh, being given the option by their aggregators to supply high-res files um, and 48, uh, 24-bit um, sort of hits that hits that that uh, criteria. I think, in fact, there's a definition by one of the American industry bodies for high definition audio and i think it is you uh i think it's 20 bit is considered high definition and i believe 48 as opposed to 44.1 is considered high definition so but yeah you're absolutely right i mean itunes is the obvious one where they encourage you to send files at the highest possible resolution yeah so very quickly my mastering maxim i i feel a bit of a cheat because i think i've already done this one in different aspects in different episodes but uh the, the maximum is to stop worrying about sample rate. Um, you know, if you're interested, you can do the test. You can test the system for intermodulation distortion and you can do your own comparisons of different sample rates and make your mind up that way. But if you have a system that's working where you get fantastic sounding results, I genuinely don't think switching up the sample rate is going to be the thing that makes the difference for you. Uh, you should be doing spending money on installing more acoustic treatment or possibly on better monitoring, or a great pair of headphones, or a really nice new mic. Uh, all of those things are going to have a much bigger impact on the final sound of your recording than whether you work at 44.1 or 96 kilohertz, in my opinion, based on what I've heard over the years, and bearing in mind that I haven't done the test myself for about five or six years. <laughs> that wasn't the snappiest, was it? I'll just repeat that. The maxim is, stop worrying about the sample rate. Um, there are more important things in life, like tuning guitars and where you put the mic and getting a great performance and all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I think you're totally spot on there. Thank you very much, Russell. I've I've enjoyed this. Um, we got pretty nerdy in the middle of that, so that's going to be a, a test for yeah. you guys out there listening. I'll be interested to see whether you love this or whether we went beyond the pale in this episode. But I do think <laughs> it's nice to kind of tackle a current issue and, and kind of really dig into this topic. So... Um, if people want to find out more about you and what you're doing, uh, where can they go online? Um, they can access my website at uh, russellcottier.com. Um, That's R U double S E double L C O double T I E R. Yep, um, dot com. And I have a, a, a new blog. Click on the blog uh, link on that website. Yeah, you've got some cool stuff there. You've just done a, a video on, on how to hear auto tune. We won't get into an auto tune tangent. Yeah, um, how to, and it's very much the same thing. It's uh, equipping people with the knowledge to um, to identify artifacts. But there's going to be loads of stuff on on that blog. Um, but I also write for uh, Resolution Magazine, so um, people can go to the website resolutionmag.com. And I also <laughs> one final one. I, I present for recordproduction.com. I'm sure a lot of the listeners will have visited that. You've reminded me, I was going to mention that, because we actually met originally through recordproduction.com. We did, yeah. uh, Mike Banks, who runs that site, um, has created a great Facebook community of everybody who's ever featured on that site, and I snuck into it somehow because I haven't yet been featured. <laughs> oh, well, Not that for needs want to be rectified. Of, of offering, I have to say, <laughs> but... Um, uh, so yeah, everybody listening to this, if you don't already know about recordproduction.com, you should head there. Only do it when you have some free time because there are yeah. hours of fascinating interviews with all the big names in the industry, I think I would say. Yeah. I challenge you to find uh, some uh, a household name in the audio engineering world who isn't there. It, apart it's from stunning, me. isn't it? Uh, but the other interesting thing that I wanted to say about that is 
I've kind of been, you know, keeping an eye on conversations that happen in that Facebook group where, you know, a good number of those engineers hang out. <laughs> um, um, most of the topics there are unrepeatable on this podcast because yes. we don't want to yeah, get an explicit what... contact rating. But the, um, <laughs> there are a couple of passionate advocates of high sample rate recording there. But there are a lot of people who basically say, I just don't care. You know, this just doesn't yeah. feature on my, my radar, you know. And these, yeah. are, these are working pros producing some of the biggest names in the industry. You know, some, some genuine legends in there who, you know, are just... It's like, yeah, well, I do this, but it's it's not a big issue for me. So it just kind of reinforces that that message, I think, from, from the maxim that Absolutely. I was saying there. I couldn't agree more, <laughs> basically. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, you. Thank you so much, Russell. Everybody should check out your various incarnations online. Yeah, um, there's there's more exciting stuff coming uh, later this year. But uh, for the moment, yeah, get yourself down to russellcottier.com blog. Uh, You've got an email list there they can sign up so they get future updates? There is, there is. If they go onto the uh, onto the blog website, they can register and they'll be kept updated. And you're on Facebook and Twitter. I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, just Google my name and you'll find all sorts of uh, all sorts of things uh, on the uh, social media and so on. In between making records, <laughs> we'll include the links and the show notes on themasteringshow.com for anybody who wants to check up there as well. So, yeah, I hope you guys found this interesting and or useful. Do check out themasteringshow.com do come say hello at Ian Shepherd on Twitter find me on Facebook uh, this week's episode was mixed and edited by John Tidy from reaperblog.net the music was by Kaylee Law my name is Ian Shepherd thanks for listening thanks for listening